most people, even today, they view the career path like this, what you see on your screen. It's a matter of time. You start your journey somewhere, you keep progressing, and one day you would be CFO or C-level executive. Well, it used to be, but no more, unfortunately. Reality has significantly changed. So today's reality is not a linear career path. So in this picture, you see two graphs or two pictures or two shapes. On the top is basically still showing a linear career path where you make progress step by step in a linear fashion. And after maybe 20, 30 or 40 years, you reach to the highest level or your desired goal to reach the highest level. What you see at the bottom of the slide is basically more what people are experiencing today. That they start somewhere, but not necessarily they always move up in a linear manner. There are situations, there are things, there are trends which are out of their control. They have to change jobs or they have they are laid off or they have to change industry or they have to go back to school. It's very common. And it's not because of your performance or poor performance. This is based on the external environment which has changed significantly. So take it as a given. Since you are developing your career in this age, this is the particular characteristics of this age or this time we are living in. And that is how we need to prepare and develop ourselves accordingly. There are still few lucky people who might experience this linear careers, but majority of us really facing and experiencing this non-linear career. And I think it's wise and prudent for us to prepare for the non-linear career, even if we have not faced it or experienced it yet. So this is an example to explain the linear and non-linear career. So the straight blue line, of course, you can see it's a linear curve and non-linear goes up, some straight lines, some downward trend, but it's sort of a zigzag. And it might happen that at some point of time, you move to a track which is more linear, but the overall career is not generally linear. Look at the bottom side, non-linear path. Actors, artists, writers, entrepreneurs, they usually have non-linear path, especially the entrepreneur profession is close to the corporate jobs. So it used to be that, look, if you want a linear career, you start a salaried job, a corporate job, and you can start a business or entrepreneurship, but it's much more non-linear. So you need to be prepared for it. Today, that gap has reduced significantly. The gap between becoming an entrepreneur or starting your own business and doing a job or employment the risk factor is more or less very close. Of course, the entrepreneurship is much more challenging and much more risky, but so is the jobs. So is most of the corporate jobs. So that gap has significantly reduced between the two type of employment. This chart shows different stages of career. And it starts with the introduction phase, which of course, when you finish or complete your studies, professional and academic, and you start your career. Now, usually, if you have done some professional certification, usually you have a smooth start. You're a chartered accountant or you are a cost and management accountant or in some other profession, you are engineer or engineering degree or MBA degree. You start usually smoothly and you make some progress. Then after a few years, you started to settle down. Then comes the growth phase in your career. And growth phase is start between three and five years. So by five years, you find yourself that you're doing well and you are making progress. This is also true for most of the professionals. Some professionals even struggle at that level. What you see in this picture, the first phase of introduction is smooth, then the phase of growth. Most people will still grow smoothly. Some people will have some challenge because of either they are in the wrong profession and they have a different aptitude or their life plan is changed. The most important part to focus is really the third phase, which is called the phase of maturity. And there, for most of the professionals, career is started to plateau. They wanted to grow at the same pace. They want to go up with the same rate of progress as they have been doing, but most will really plateau. And for significant amount of those professionals, the curve would also go down. They could have, uh, serious level of stagnation 
or fall in their career growth. Some lucky ones will still grow in that phase, of course. I believe that most of you are in this phase, phase of maturity. So phase of maturity, if you are somewhere around between the age group of 35 to 45, you are in this group. You might have a little different situation, but majority of you would be between 35 and 45 are in the mid of the, your career. And that is what you are experiencing. Flattening of curve, right? Now, no matter where you are making progress or you are flattened or you are falling down, you further make progress and move into the next phase, which is called the phase of saturation. Phase of saturation for majority, I would say, except for a very few exceptions, this is a maturing phase where you are basically wrapping up your career. That starts after, I would say, somewhere around 55. So you now you are either you are you're maintaining and holding your position you have reached so far, or you started to decline or slowing down in preparation of the retirement or whatever. And then finally, you exit from the work environment. So that's a typical pattern. So let's come back to this career plateau or maturity phase where most of you are and the challenges you are facing here. This was always a pattern like this historically. But in today's time, based on all the changes taking place in the environment, in the industry, in the businesses, in the technology, this phase has even become a lot more challenging, a lot more challenging. And dynamics of career management has significantly changed. Unfortunately, not majority of professionals have realized, majority of professionals are still trying to manage their careers through historical way. And that is why they are struggling. This chart is also very interesting and informative. So what is going to happen in the corporate world? This is related to the resources or employ employment. When you look at this chart, you will see different layers of the people who are supporting the organization. And the first layer is the core on-site employees. Right? Then you have remote employees. Then you have freelancers and gig workers. Then you have consultants. Then you have contingent workers. Then you have external resources. Which means that if today an organization have a lot of core on-site workers, they are not going to have the same number soon. They would have fewer employees, but more talented employees retained by the company and highly paid by the way. So you can understand that if they are only going to retain highly paid core employees, those employees have to be highly talented as well. It's not about an average employee, average worker that if they have to make choices, who is contingent, who is core employee full time on the site, they would like to keep people who are highly talented and they are willing to pay high salaries and high payments, high wages for those people. Now, where do you want to be? You can have a choice. You can say, I'm happy to be a contingent worker or contract worker or happy to be where I am. But if you want to really an ambitious career oriented person, you would like to be in the core category. The first core on-site employees, highly talented, highly paid which means that you have to do your job, your part. First, learning the skills, getting talented, and then hopefully you'll find your place into that category. And all this is going to lead to one harsh reality. There are more people looking for jobs than the jobs available. That's very clear. There is no doubt. And it's not going to change again. It's not temporary that it's going, people will say that it would get better. This is going to get worse, actually. If you could recall the future of job reports by World Economic Forum last year, what their predictions or projections are, they're all going in one direction only. There would be more people seeking for employment than the opportunities available. So it is going to be more comparative, whether you like it or not, it has to be more comparative, which means that in order to find your job, you have to be better than others. That's a harsh reality. So one common threat across all the industries, all the profession, all the jobs is the automation. That now I think it's becoming a lot more clearer that what is at risk and what is not. But the general concern is that whether robots will take my job or not. So let's try to understand what robots 
or machines or computer offer. Automation offers only three skills very clearly, speed, accuracy, and memory. And it's very clear we cannot compete with automation with reports on these three skills, the speed, accuracy, memory, we cannot compete with them. Let's accept it, which means all the jobs which require speed, accuracy, and memory are being taken over by robots or automation. And they are doing a much better job. All the mechanization or automation in different industries is mainly built on speed, accuracy, and memory. So what we could do as humans, look at the human's capability or unique skills. So we have unique skills in the area of higher cognitive skills and social and emotional skills. Now, computers are making progress here, but I think still they are not very close where what human could offer, especially related to the social and emotional skills, emotional intelligence. I'm not sure if we could see a robot with having the same level of emotional intelligence in our lifetime. For some people, this is crisis. This is challenge. For many people, this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity to upgrade yourself. If you are involved in a job which requires speed, accuracy, and memory, promote yourself. Try to do something more valuable, which is related to higher cognitive skills and social and emotional skills. So I know that everybody is not prepared. They were very comfortable in the speed, accuracy, memory jobs, but again, accept the reality. It's no more there. If you want to survive, you want to make progress, you need to learn something. So learning has become inevitable for everyone. Lifelong learning, actually. And this is another chart showing shifting priorities in terms of skills. So building upon the same argument that we could offer as humans, we could offer a lot more value. Look what skills are at the top. So in this chart, Critical thinking and analysis is on the top in terms of increasing growing demand, problem solving, self-management, working with people, management and communication of activities, and so on. And at the bottom, you see there are skills which are related to technology use, core literacies, and physical abilities, which are actually declining. So I think every one of us understand what is happening and where the demand is coming or going towards. What I see as a main challenge for many people is to understand how they could develop these skills. So there is a trap. When you look at the skills like critical thinking, analysis, problem solving, self-management, working with people, many people will say, I can do it or I already do it. There is really not much for me to learn anymore. That's a trap. Now these terms look or sound very familiar but what they are talking about is a very deep level of understanding and expertise in these areas. Those people who really struggle understanding that what are these skills we are talking about and where they apply, look at this slide. I think this is also from Deloitte. So we are talking about curiosity as a skill, imagination as a skill, intuition as a skill, creativity, empathy, emotional intelligence where these activities uh, skills are applied look in the within this circle some activities for example identifying unseen problems and opportunities developing solutions to address problems and opportunities implementing solutions iterating and learning the activities of redefined work so this is related to that core segment of employees who are highly talented, retained by the company and highly paid. That is their job. Their job is not related to speed, accuracy and memory. Their job is not well defined, actually. But having these skills like curiosity, intuition, creativity, empathy, problem solving, they have the ability to find out the problems and solve them for the company. This is what they are looking for, employers. Are you in that category or can you be in that category? Or if you are still not clear about what is being required by employers, look at these four categories, creativity, collaboration, communication, critical thinking. Do you have these skills? And again, not at the surface level, but the deeper level. Look at this slide closely. You may find yourself in three zones or three categories here. First is the comfort zone. Then we have a learning zone, 
panic zone. This is related to the learning status. Comfort zone is for the people who think that they already know enough and there is no urgency. There is no need to really learn any further. So they are in their comfort zone. If you look around, you will see that there are many, many people, majority of the professionals are still in their comfort zone because they think that either they believe things are not changing as much as they other people are suggesting or they think that they know everything they need to know. So they remain in their comfort zone until a day comes when they find themselves in the panic zone. So if you are not in the learning zone, you will find yourself sooner in a panic zone. So this is not the time to be in the panic zone or in the comfort zone. This is the time to be in the learning zone. Whether you see the risk or danger or not, this is the time to start learning whatever you feel appropriate for you to develop yourself or future opportunities. And future opportunities may not be visible yet. But you need to prepare for those opportunities. It's not about the roles and jobs. It's about the skill development. Look at those skills and try to develop those skills. These skills are broad. These skills are global. These skills are transferable, which means that you are not confined to few specific roles. If you have developed these type of skills, you can fit to any multiple areas or multiple type of roles in certain areas. And we talked about C-suite responsibilities or roles. C-suite are those type of roles where mainly you require fundamentally leadership and strategic skills. With this situation, especially in the employed category of professionals, when you are working for a company, there is very minimal chance that you would continue to work for that company for the rest of your life. Experts are saying that millennials are expected to make 12 to 15 job changes, 12 to 15 on the average, right? Now, if 12 to 15 job changes, which means that the company you are working today does not matter because you will change job and probably you will be working for another company, right? So if company doesn't matter, do you need to invest too much in the company? Probably not, because in three to five years, you will change to another company. I'm not suggesting that you should not be loyal to the company. You should not really understand the processes. But there is something different considered as long term investing into the company yourself for a long career. When you move from a company to another company, what you take with you is your skills, is your experience, not the company itself. So if you are moving in the same industry, some industry related experience may be relevant, but most important thing for a new employer is your skill set, not your experience. Transferable skills becomes very, very crucial and, and important in this environment with this reference. Transferable skills are the skills which you use in your profession, in your job. And if you move a job, those skills stay with you. You can use those skills in other jobs or maybe other industry as well. These are portable skills. For example, you are working in a company and company has its own proprietary processes, which may be good for the company, but you develop a lot of experience on those proprietary processes and you go to another company, that is not a transferable skill because that was useful to your previous employer, not to the new employer. When you are picking and choosing the set of skills you need to really develop, think of the profession you are going to work for the rest of your career, not the job. Very commonly in the job, you will also find those portable skills. But I'm just trying to explain that if there is something very specific to a company, then of course, if as long as you are working with a company, you need to learn it. But don't invest too much because if you move to another company, th that skill may not be required. So that's the type of the skills of transferable skills. Even at the broader level, try to see which skills are really more portable or transferable. So it comes to the two type of skills, two category. One is the technical skills. Other is the soft skills or leadership skills. Leadership skills are more transferable, more portable than the technical skills. So at this time, just try to understand that a specific company experience is useful as long as you are working for that company, but it may not be transferable. Industry experience is useful as long as you want to make a move within the industry. But more importantly, your general portable skills, your communication, your leadership, as long as you want to remain in finance, you are, of course, your financial competency 
and IFRS knowledge is relevant. Try to follow a general rule that what is skills and experience is applicable to the companies and the future employers you expect to move into. One crucial question in front of us, every one of us is that if, if this is the situation related to the nature of skills and demands on us to learn what skills you need to learn. Now, again, generalize into broad categories. I think uh, there was uh, has been a question always that do I want to become a generalist or do I want to become a specialist? If I relate it with the profession, you can say that do you want to be a treasurer or a tax expert that's a specialist or do you want to be a senior level vice president finance that's more like generalist? If you look at the life cycle of a skill as we just discussed, that if there's a very limited time span of learning skills, it would be more prudent for us to learn the skills which have a longer life, which are general in nature. So skills which are globally applicable, which have a longer life, which are transferable, should be the skills we need to spend more time. Now, based on your job and profession, you still need to learn some specific skills. But as I said, we are generalizing. When we generalize, it looks like that the generalist path is more common. But again, you don't have to really pick one or two between the specialist and generalist. There is a third category which is emerging is versatilist. Versatilist is a specialist as well as a generalist. And look at the few bullets on the right side. What does it tell? So a specialist, deep skills, narrow scope, peer recognized, unknown outside domain. This is the tax expert or merger and acquisition expert in an organization. Generalist is broad scope, shallow skills, quick response, and others lack confidence in this area. So this could be, as I said, vice president finance or even a CFO could be a generalist. Versatilist is deep skills, wide scope of roles, broad experience, recognized in other domains as well. Versatilist is a professional who has multiple deep skills. He or she can fulfill the various roles. They have a broad experience and they are also recognized in other domains. And the most common category which falls into this area is C-suit executive. Generally in the organization, you see CMOs, CEO, COO, CTO, CFO, CRO. These are all the chief officers of something. Chief executive officer, chief financial officer, chief information officer, chief technology officer, chief of, uh, marketing officer, etc., etc. Realize one thing that CEO is definitely a very broad description, but other areas like CFO, CTO, CMO, it feels that they are very specialized roles actually. So CFO is supposed to be a financial expert only or CMO is supposed to be a marketing expert, or CTO is supposed to be a technology expert. It is not like that, actually. I know many CFOs who are not trained in accounting, who do not have an accounting background. I know several CTOs and CIOs who do not have a technical background. So why they are CFOs and CTOs? because that is not the requirement of the job. What is not required? Why C-suit role? So relate it with the generalist and specialist roles we just talked about, right? And think of a versatilist somewhere in between. And then think of the C-suit role. What is the typical C-suit role? Is applicable to CFOs, CTOs, CMOs, CEOs, every C-level role. What is not required, so this is contrary to the general belief and general understanding that a CTO is supposed to be a highly expert in technology or CFO has to be highly specialized in finance. It's not required. It's nice to have, but no technical knowledge or expertise required for these roles, number one. No professional certification or higher academic degree required for this role. You do not need to be an extraordinary functional expert in this area and no specific experience is required in this role. These are nice to have. Most people have it but what I'm trying to explain here, it's not required. What is required, however, 
is a reasonable level of functional expertise. If you are a CFO, you have to have a reasonably good idea what finance function is. Same applies for marketing and technology and logistics supply chain, etc. What is required? Very crucial, outstanding leadership skills. What is required? Extraordinary, high level of emotional intelligence. What is very important? A deep insight is business strategy, understanding the overall business model and excellent communication skills. This is required on the right side, the bullets. These are required. If you don't have one of one or a few of those, it would be difficult for you to survive in that role. What you see on the left is nice to have. If you have good, that would be extra advantage, but it is not required. If that is the case, see yourself, look back at your background, look at your career, look at your talent and see, can you fill one of these roles? And also including CFOs, by the way. So most of the people sitting here, I assume you are finance professionals and your goal is to really land into a CFO role. But CFO role does not require those things on the left side. What is required on the right side? So I often see people coming to me and asking that who are basically struggling in their career, asking that I'm an ACCA, should I do CMA also? Because they think that by adding those qualification and certification, it would help them their career. No, if you want to spend time and money and resources, then spend on the leadership learning skills, learning a strategy about the business. Those things will make the difference. Practice a lot about your communication skills. Those things will really make a difference for you. If you believe that, it's a lot more easier because all those things, even if you don't have today, is doable. Learning a strategy or learning leadership or practicing communication skills is not rocket science. You can do it easily. That is where this versatilist role comes. So once you are in this category, you have basically versatile set of skills with you. You can do multiple roles. Now, this is also very important in the scenario where we are not sure about the future. In the future of job reports, I think with consistency, they have said that it's very difficult even for experts to predict on project what roles would survive, what role would not survive. So they are not much talking about the roles and jobs anymore. What they are talking about is the skills because they are very clear that what skills would be required on future, but they're not sure what roles those skills would be applied to. Same goes for CFO role. When I have spent my life as a CFO and I have some expertise, I could tell you five years from now, would there be a CFO role? I don't know. But there will be someone else using those skills which are required by a CFO. So in this situation, is it not smart to focus on the skills rather than roles and also try to develop those skills which are more universal, which are more global, which are more transferable. So if you don't become CFO, you become someone else at the same level. Or you change industries. Or you change occupation. So leadership, strategy, communication, these are all very broad skills, but very valuable and they have a long life cycle. They're not going to be obsolete in our lifetime. I can, I can see that clearly. Why not spend our time and money into developing these skills? Again, I'm not suggesting that you don't do those technical skills. If it is required, you will do, but broadly speaking, your focus should be these soft skills not really trying to do another CMA in addition to your ACC or chart accountancy. You may survive probably in the corporate environment with some junior level positions. But look, if you are sitting in this webinar, probably you are already well qualified. You are well educated, well qualified, and you have all the talent and attributes to become a C-level executive. So why not? Utilize that opportunity and you need to do some hard work, but hard work is only developing your leadership talent, which is very natural. Personal branding and relationship is one thing. Learning a strategy is easier than many people think. Once you combine all these things, you are pretty much ready for a C-level role. That's what we are talking about. To reach this level, of course, you need to go through a journey. And this diagram shows you awareness, understanding, acceptance, value shift belief application and transformation. You do need a transformation, there is no doubt. But look, transformation is not easy. Many people start their journey from the awareness and they stuck at the understanding level. 
for example, some of you in this webinar sitting, they say, okay, I got a very good idea. I understand what Salim is talking about, right? And then you stop there. You don't do anything. You are stuck between acceptance and understanding. That will not yield you anything. You need to take that message from the awareness and understanding and take it up to the level of transformation. How would you do that? You need to take actions. So what are the actions? We talked about the skill pyramid. These are the top 10 skills for future, top 10 skills mentioned by different forums and different uh, organizations. And I created this skill pyramid to help you understand the importance of that. Three skills which are fundamental to learn these skills are personal brand relationship we are talking about and then communication. I suggested you that focus on communication because if you don't have good communication, you even cannot learn these 10 skills. You need communication as a basic tool to go through those skills one by one. If you want to learn something, or you want to change yourself, you want to build your career, you start with something like creating awareness, then understanding, then acceptance, value shift, belief, application, transfer. Transformation is the very high level. Now, typically what happens, if you want to learn something new, you will enroll for a training, online or offline, whatever. And you would go in the training and you would listen to the lecture, or you would read a book or you watch a movie, right? And you develop some understanding and awareness. That's the first two levels. And then you will see that, okay, I have learned enough. What you have learned is nothing. Because if you don't follow up further in two to four weeks, you are back to where you started. That happens with most of the typical traditional trainings. You go to a five day training, full day, full five days training. You spend a lot of time, you enjoy it. You learn a lot but then you come back with a lot of information, don't do anything, put all the information on the shelf, and in three to four weeks, you are back to square one where you started, right? Now to make progress on this scale, which you're looking at your screen, you need to do something practically, which means that, okay, first step is de definitely developing knowledge, but then you need to practice it. That is where people struggle. You need to practice, you need to interact with other people, and you ultimately you reach to a level of acceptance, value shift, your belief changes, you're doing it every day, and then you get into the transformation mode. Let me elaborate that point a little further because this is very important. So most of the people in profession are in the process of knowledge building. Now this is important. We did, we actually spend first half of our life building our knowledge, right? school, college, university, we were building knowledge to prepare our career. That was one phase. That was the major part of knowledge building. Then you started your career. And in your career, you were supposed to use that knowledge. Knowledge execution. The knowledge build up, first phase of life, knowledge execution, second phase of life. How do you execute the knowledge? It's very different. To execute the knowledge, you need to work with people. And unfortunately, we are not trained to work with the people. We are not taught communication. We are not taught emotional intelligence. Many people struggle. Some lucky ones who have the naturally gifted, they survive, they succeed. But many people struggle because they are not trained into it. Now, on top of it, what happens that when we are in the second phase, we try to further build the knowledge. So we are going to trainings. We are doing some certifications and building the knowledge and still not executing it. That's a big mistake. That is why you see a lot of many people who have long abbreviations next to their name, all ABC alphabet actually, and they are sitting on a junior junior position because they misunderstood. It's not about getting certification and degrees only. You need to apply practically. This chart is from Harvard University, so pretty reliable. And it's very simple and straightforward. There are two lines crossing each other. One line is the your ability to learn your response to experiences, what, whatever you do every day, what you learn. And this declines with the age very clearly. You see it's starting, his scale is starting with the age of two, four, six, eight, ten, very young, very high level of learning capability. As you progress in your age, this ability declines. And I think by close to age of 30, it's breaking even. Breaking even with what? The other line is the amount of effort required to change. Again, young age, you have very high capability to change yourself. You go to school every day and you learn a lot. You change a lot. But as you get matured life in the middle of your career, it becomes a struggle. 
you are learning, but your ability also declining. So by 30 years of age, you are at the break even of your learning capability and learning effort. Then why are we sitting here? Does it mean that we cannot learn afterwards? Absolutely not. But what you need to do, you need to change your efforts, make more efforts to learn. You learn all of your life in the beginning phase by just going to school and listening to the lectures. In real life, after first phase, you need to practice it. You don't learn by listening to lectures. That is what happens with five days training when you go there and you just listen to the lecture and you come back in two weeks, four weeks, it's all gone. That doesn't work. So you need to practice, which means you need to make, need to make efforts. When you go to a specialized training program or make some special efforts, sitting with a peer group and do something different, then there are chances of learning. And this is the famous framework from Mecca CEO of Academy. I have shared many times. It's very simple, very straightforward, but very powerful. So it, it's universal, it's global. It doesn't relate to any specific role or a specific industry or a specific level. For all professionals, this is applicable. It is starts from the bottom and it is starts with developing your own personal leadership. And in the personal leadership, it starts with setting up a mindset. Because experts say that 90% of the failure and success we see in life are related to our mindset. Now, you could question whether it's 90% or some other percentage, but this is reality that our mindset plays a major role in determining our direction and path to failure or success. So first we work on our mindset because that is the fundamental area which makes our life a lot more easier. Then we work still on ourselves, developing the right habits, developing a lifestyle of work-life integration. Once we have developed our personal leadership, then we try to prepare ourselves to deal with the world. And there are two marketing tools for personal marketing we talked about last time, is the personal branding and relationship and networking. And again, not many people really give enough regard to these things as if that they believe that there is no space of relationship or networking at work. They just think it's work is work. This is not true. Personal branding and relationship and networking plays a significant role. So as you move up into the corporate ladder, you have more and more requirement of these skills. So why not learn it wherever you are? And once you have developed some competency in these two areas, then you are ready to deal with the world. And the only way you deal with the world is your communication skills. That is the only window that opens to the world. So if you are, if you are not good at communication, you may not be able to communicate or interact properly with the world. And once you are ready to do your communication with the world, you have only one result in front of you one goal, one objective, which is creating influence. Just creating influence on the people around you. And if you keep focus on that, all other things will come as a byproduct. Your salary, your promotion, your rank, all those things come as a byproduct. Now you could still set them as objective, but your main objective, your prime objective should be creating influence on the people around you. So what is your career strategy? Very simple, three things. Your knowledge is already there. You already have expertise in your area, right? And most people think that's all you need. I have done my CPA or MBA or master's degree and I know enough. This is my knowledge expertise and I'm ready for career. Completely wrong. In today's time, you need two more things on the side. One on the left side, you see your soft skills. Because soft skills is the skills which help you execute your knowledge, your communication, your relationship, your emotional intelligence. These are the tools to help you or to equip you to deploy your knowledge. That's one. Other thing is your personal brand, your reputation, very important. If you don't have an external image or reputation, all of your knowledge and skills are useless. Because you may feel that you have all the knowledge and skills. It is not relevant what is relevant, what other people think of you. What are the senior people or the hiring people or your bosses or your senior executive think about you? That is what you achieve through your personal branding. And once you combine these three things, you become ready to receive career opportunities. And let me give you a final punch on this message because some people think this is a lot of work. How could I do that? And majority is not doing it. Majority of the professional are not doing it. They are smart. They understand it. But they think probably I don't need it. Other people need it, right? Well, here is my 
one of the interesting stories. So two friends were walking through a jungle and they see a tiger running towards them from a distance. One friend hurriedly started to change his shoes into a running shoes. The other friend astonishingly asked him, hey, what are you doing? What do you think? Can you run faster than the tiger? The first friend replied, no, I don't need to run faster than the tiger. I just need to run faster than you. So look, that is what is happening. You don't need to do all the hard work. Majority of your competitors are not doing work, not doing enough work. If you do little extra, you will be the winner. That's the opportunity. This is the opportunity because of the negligence and lack of other people. Grab it for it becomes a lot more competitive. My general advice is that wherever you are, if you are focusing on your career or your job, now some of you may be very stable. I would suggest even to do those people to just try to relook, refresh your look to your career planning. So most of you would be in a situation basically to relook at your career and relaunch your career. And I would advise you to take a fresh start from a blind blank slate and try to look at your SWOT analysis, your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threat. And I think I have shared you a framework to do that. Identify your skills and gaps and try to see which skills you want to develop further, which gaps you want to fill. Of course, you cannot fill all the gaps, but you need to be very selective. And then develop your career strategy, taking into account the changes, changes taking place in the industries, your current company situation, your opportunity and potential to move in the same industry or outside industry, industries. Look across all the potential opportunities and possibilities and try to work together a peer support group. So you may have a networking with your CPA network or chartered account network or anywhere you have few other people with the similar mind, try to work with them. That is the best way to really come and bring the best ideas.